This week, there were several happenings in the world of Bitcoin that made me think I should sit down and do a short talk about a topic that I have been thinking about and working on extensively over the past few months. Those events were, there was some news about individuals creating a protocol whereby they could instantly move funds from their fiat bank account and then be able to spend them on the Lightning Network. Simultaneously, there was news that the Bitcoin core developers were going to, by default, remove functionality for the Bitcoin payment protocol, otherwise known as BIP70, from the Bitcoin core wallet. That's the wallet that goes alongside of the full node. And most spectacularly, the long-awaited release of BACT, the uh, financial product that was coming directly from Wall Street and was going to offer physically settled, I don't even know how that's possible, physically settled Bitcoin futures just happened to spark a sell-off in the market whereby everybody had said that it was going to create a, a new bull run because institutional was coming. And so with all of that taking place, I want to just revisit a tweet that I have mentioned in other talks before. This was something that I tweeted in November of 2018, and I have retweeted many times, including again today. And the tweet says, if you want the price to go back up, get back to asking the question, what is Bitcoin? If you want the price to keep dropping, keep acting like you know the answer. What is Bitcoin? What is it? If you know what Bitcoin is, if you have a good idea of what Bitcoin is, then you can start to behave in such a way and take actions within the space that enables Bitcoin to be more Bitcoin. That is to say, if you use a tool in the way that the tool is best used, you will derive the most profit from the tool. And if we want to know what Bitcoin is, the first and best place is to go straight to the creator and see what he thought Bitcoin was. Now, maybe we end up disagreeing, but at least that's a place to start. <laughs> and so if we go to the white paper, the very first sentence says what Satoshi Nakamoto believes Bitcoin to be. A purely peer-to-peer -peer version of electronic cash would allow online payments to be sent directly from one party to another without going through a financial institution. That's the first sentence. This is what the creator thought was valuable about his creation, that he had created a purely peer-to-peer -peer version of electronic cash that does what? It allows online payments to be sent directly from one party to another without going through a financial institution. Stop and think about that for a second. In 2008, this was impossible. How would you make online purchases? Well, you had a few options in 2008, but mainly it was either going to be with a credit card through a payment processor. Okay, that's a financial institution. Or maybe you could do it with something like PayPal or one of the PayPal competitors that was essentially a bank and that was using its own sort of proprietary network as opposed to the Visa network or the MasterCard network. Again, going through a financial institution. The second sentence, he says, digital signatures provide part of the solution, but the main benefits are lost if a trusted third party is still required to prevent double spending. The main benefits of this system that he created are lost when a trusted third party is involved. When a trusted third party is required to prevent double spending, He's very clear on what he means by double spending, on the problem that he's trying to solve. In fact, he spends the introduction detailing the fact that the problem at hand is the ability of payments to be reversed. This is what he's calling the double spending problem. Everybody knows what this reverse payment means, at least everybody who's ever dealt with a payment processor or who's received payments through Visa, let's say, or MasterCard. This is when somebody calls and basically cancels a payment or cancels a check. And then all of a sudden, 
your bank account is just simply debited or a hold is put on funds. Basically, that somebody can spend money, receive services, which Satoshi Nakamoto is very clear that this is the most damaging thing. Actually, it's not about merchandise necessarily because you can always recover merchandise, but non-reversible services, he says this specifically, is a problem. If I pay you because you cut my lawn and then I call and I say, oh, this is a fraudulent charge. I don't know what this charge is. And the bank reverses it against you and takes the money from you. You can't come and reclaim the labor and time. It's just gone. And so he's saying this is the problem that it solves. And the problem is that as long as you have trusted third parties, as long as you cannot send online payments directly from one party to another without going through a financial institution, you will always have a problem of reversed payments because custodians have to answer to their clientele. They have to provide that service. It's just a natural thing about trust, which is why he says you need a system based not on trust, but on cryptographic proof. And that's Bitcoin. On a larger scale, when we're looking at what is Bitcoin and what is a Bitcoin economy, because if we want the number to go up, what is that number? What is that number, that price as versus the US dollar or euro or whatever it is? What is it a bet on? It's a bet on the future viability of an economy that's based on Bitcoin. All of these maximalists, they talk about, oh, there's only 21 million Bitcoin. So... Not everybody's going to get one and blah, blah, blah. They're talking about a scenario of hyper-Bitcoinization. They're talking about a scenario where Bitcoin is the core value transfer network that is running the economy, that the economy is built on top of. And so in order for that to be valuable, it's got to have all the benefits. But Satoshi says in the second sentence of the white paper, the main benefits are lost if a trusted third party is still required to prevent double spending. The main benefits are lost if a custodian needs to be involved in a transaction. So we've gotten to a point where we can see that Bitcoin's architecture solves the double spending problem for person-to-person -person transactions. Me to you, you're in front of me, or I'm gonna send this to you, but we're seeing that there is still a great need for financial services, especially if we're gonna do this at scale. And it's not even at a big scale yet, but merchants are needing financial services. In particular, they need payment processors. But let's take a look at the big payment processors. BitPay and Coinbase, they're custodians of funds. If you're a BitPay merchant and you are using BitPay services and I'm the customer, I'm shown a payment request, an invoice that I need to pay that's coming from BitPay's website. I pay it. It goes into BitPay's custody, and then BitPay disperses those funds to you. But what does Satoshi Nakamoto say? The main benefits are lost if a trusted third party is still required. BitPay is a trusted third party. Coinbase is a trusted third party. There's no reason for Bitcoin if the online payment is not sent directly from one party to another without going through a financial institution. If we aren't going to build on that model, we should not expect number to go up. A true Bitcoin economy, one which disrupts the existing financial paradigm, one which leads to Bitcoin truly becoming what it's meant to be, means removing custodianship from the economy completely while still being able to offer the complete suite of financial services that are offered in the current paradigm. And Bitcoin is able to do this, and we don't talk about this enough. But the reason that Bitcoin can do this, and it's on purpose that this is a fundamental part of the structure of Bitcoin, is that Bitcoin's multi-output transaction structure is what allows for the creation of a purely peer-to-peer -peer cash economy. A purely peer-to-peer. -peer. That is the beginning words of the white paper. The core business model of custodians, which for the most part, I mean, we really can think of them as banks, is simple. It's been around for a very long time. You deposit your money. The bank keeps some percentage of that deposit in the form of fees or commissions as a revenue. They settle this revenue amount 
at the point at which you withdraw or send funds from out of your balance. There are many variations of this model, and the model has become more complex as the complexity of financial networks has increased, but the basic revenue model for custodians remains the same. The problem, as Satoshi Nakamoto saw, is that in an economy with heavy reliance on trusted third parties, custodians, censorship of financial transactions is guaranteed. Bitcoin is censorship resistant, but its censorship resistance is because it is a purely peer-to-peer -peer version of electronic cash. It's because the custodians are not there that it is censorship resistant. The second you have a custodian, you have a means by which to censor a financial transaction. And we see this with banks. Banks can seize funds on behalf of governments. Banks can put holds on funds. They can prevent you from using your bank account or accessing your funds. If they get some sort of red flag that says, oh, there may be something criminal going on here, even if there isn't, they can do it by their own set of rules. This is what censorship is. Whether it's custodian of funds or whether it's custodian of data, which we've seen in the censorship of the alternative news media. They've got a hold of your data. They're the custodians. They're storing it on their servers. Well, they can prevent access as they so choose. This is what Bitcoin was built to prevent. This is what Bitcoin is. This is the problem that Bitcoin is solving. This is why it's valuable. The main benefits are lost if a trusted third party is still required to prevent double spending. The quote, Permit me to issue and control the money of a nation, and I care not who makes its laws. That's attributed to Meyer Amschel Rothschild, of the Rothschilds. Make me the custodian of the funds of a nation, and I am in control. I don't care who makes the laws, because the laws don't matter. It's about controlling the flow, the lifeblood of an economy, which is money. And that's why Satoshi said, the main benefits of Bitcoin are lost if a trusted third party is still required. We want an economy that isn't suffering. We don't want to have to give up anything. Bitcoin is not about having to give up the financial and technological advances that have come along. It's about bringing control back to the individual. Let's take some examples of financial services. Insurance agents. Definitely a financial service, generally non-custodial. You pay for your policy, but you don't hand over your funds necessarily to an insurance agent for them to hold on to them. Attorneys and accountants, right? CPAs, generally non-custodial. They're doing a financial service for you, no doubt, helping you to arrange your financial affairs. But in general, you pay them either on a retainer basis or on an hourly basis for their work. Generally non-custodial, you don't hand your money over. Except in the case when, let's say, one of them is acting as a trustee. You're going to have your inheritance when you pass away. You're going to put it in the hands of a trustee who's going to hold on to it until it can be dispersed. That's a custodian. Escrow agents. Generally custodial. You hand over your property either you or you and some other party until all of the terms of a particular contract are met, the escrow agent acts as a trusted third party and disperses the funds when it has all been met. Say money transmitters like Western Union, MoneyGram, generally custodial, almost always. <laughs> you hand over your money to them and then they make sure that your money is delivered to some other destination and some other person. Venmo, PayPal, these newer financial networks, definitely custodial. Both PayPal and Venmo have uh, separate balances, right? So they're holding separate ledgers just like a bank would. And they can most certainly censor transactions. I just had a situation today where my wife, who is Russian, was trying to buy groceries for her mother in Russia, but she's got a US address and when she tried to do this via PayPal with her PayPal balance, it was denied. 
because of the sanctions regime, which her mother is not being somebody that's being sanctioned, but I guess PayPal has just decided that they're not going to allow certain of these payments, even though the merchant accepted PayPal. It's just that it was going from the US to Russia. Boom, censored. This is what Bitcoin fixes. Banks, obviously custodial. And then you've got your payment networks like Visa and MasterCard, and these are networks of custodians, networks of banks. And then you also have your crypto payment processors, BitPay, Coinbase, others, exchanges, custodial. The main benefit of Bitcoin is lost if a custodian is still required. But Bitcoin has the capability to displace the current custodial business models while retaining the value of the services being provided by the custodians themselves. In the case of banks and money transmitters, the disruptive ability of Bitcoin is clear. We figured that one out. Our next step is in the case of trustees, escrow agents, and payment processors, Bitcoin facilitates non-custodial financial services. It allows all of those things, trustees, escrow agents, payment processors, and more, without those services ever needing to take custody of your funds. They're able to act more in a way that your accountant or your attorney would act, helping you to complete the process, but not needing to take control of your funds. But how does Bitcoin do this? What's so disruptive about Bitcoin? For nearly 1,000 years since the time of the Knights Templar, sophisticated financial networks capable of moving value over vast distances required so much capital to build and maintain that those networks remained in the hands of an elite few. Others who wanted to use those networks could only do so with the permission of those in control of the networks. The model was simple. Deposit your funds with the custodians who controlled the network, and for a fee, those custodians would ensure that your funds reach some other person or place. That's it. Simple model that evolved into all that we have today in terms of the financial system. But at the core of it, the core idea of a trusted third party is the absolute key and bedrock. And that's what Bitcoin disrupts. Bitcoin, when it's used as a pure peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system, allows direct transfer of value between any two individuals that can get internet access or otherwise access a functioning node on the network. Bitcoin's multiple output transaction structure allows multiple individuals to be sent funds in a single transaction. This means that those providing financial services can receive their revenue directly in a separate output in a transaction without ever taking custody of funds whatsoever. Trustees even are still possibly non-custodial. Escrow is still possible non-custodially. Payment processor services are still possible non-custodially. All of these non-custodial financial services are possible with an improved overall user experience and affordability as compared to traditional custodial models. And this is where we reach the next step in Bitcoin's evolution, because what's required to make all of these non-custodial financial services possible is that we have to have some sort of a payment protocol. We need to have some way for a merchant to tell a buyer all of the various outputs and the associated amounts that they'll need to include in their transaction in order for it to be accepted by the merchant. And this allows us to have non-custodial financial services. Now, luckily, back in 2013, Mike Hearn and Gavin Andreessen actually came up with a payment protocol that would do this. It was included as the 70th Bitcoin improvement proposal, BIP70, and it's called the Bitcoin payment protocol. This payment protocol has existed in some form in the code of a great many wallets and various different wallet frameworks, and yet it hasn't really been used all of that much. In fact, only a neutered form of this, one that doesn't even allow multiple outputs, has been used by BitPay. When BitPay decided to support Ethereum, that was the straw that broke the camel's back for the Bitcoin core maximalists. They were already upset that BitPay happily supported Bitcoin Cash, their arch nemesis. And so they sent a signal and removed the functionality of BIP70 from 
the default settings of the Bitcoin Core wallet. Now, not that many people use the Bitcoin Core wallet for transactions, but it was meant to send a signal to BitPay that the Core tribe was unhappy with their decision to not participate in Bitcoin maximalism. Now, the Bitcoin Cash community has been exploring this year BIP70, and I'm hearing it much more. I don't think people fully realize what it can do, but there is clearly some suspicion that it might be valuable, and Bitcoin is all about that. It's all about the fact that people suspect it might be valuable. Well, it's very, very valuable, and it's something that only Bitcoin can do. Lightning Network can't do it. Without BIP70, you can't do it, not effectively. And BIP70 is probably not the last that we will hear of this. We'll need to evolve a payment protocol as we go forward. There are lots of things missing and lots of functionality that we would like to add. But it's a start. And it's a way to explore what is Bitcoin.